You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. Hey everybody. If you have your Bibles, you know where to go. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, meet me there. We've been in a series on the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's called the series Grasping for Meaning. How do we find meaning in a world that seems to be meaningless? This morning, um, I'm going to begin with a quiz, and this quiz is 50% of your grade, so you need to make sure you do well on it. Uh, What I'm going to do is put up the question. When I ask you the question, you're going to say one, two, three, or four. You'll lift up one if you think the answer is number one, two, three, or four. And again, if uh, you don't do well, you'll have to retake this entire course. So let's look at the first question. According to Sports Illustrated, and if you're watching at home, um, uh, put in the chat what your answer would be. According to Sports Illustrated, what percentage of NFL players are bankrupt or financially stressed within two years of retirement? One, 34%, two, 52%, three, 78%, four, 91%. What do you think? All right, so when I give you the answer, if you have the correct answer, I want you to keep your hand up so we can see who got it correctly. The correct answer is number three, 78%. 78%, okay, great. Uh, Next question. According to Sports Illustrated, what percentage of NBA players are broke five years after walking off the court? One, 12%, two, 60%, three, 77%, four, 22%. What do you think? What do you think? All right. If you have number two up, you'd be correct. 60%. 60%. Okay. Uh, Last question. If you make this much a year, you are in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. Uh, number one, 50,000, two, 37,000, three, 68,000, four, 87,000. If you make this much a year, you are in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. <laughs> All right. If you have number two up, you'd be correct. 37,000, you're in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. Here's a question I want to ask you this morning. How much money would you need to make to say that you are rich? How much money would you need to make to be able to say that you are rich? Now, according to a Gallup poll, they asked people this question. How much money would you need to consider yourself rich or to feel rich? And what they found is the answers that most people gave was about double what they made. So if they made 30,000, they gave 60. If they made 50,000, they gave 100,000. They then asked, uh, Money Magazine asked uh, its readers, what amount would you need to feel rich? And what the answer they gave was around 5 million in liquid assets. And liquid assets mean it's able to be converted to money easily and, and quickly. So Five million. So if you go by what the Gallup poll showed, it means that these people probably made around 2.5 million. But how much would you need to consider yourself rich? And the thing that you'll notice is that the higher you go, the higher that number gets. And there really is no number that you could say is what someone would consider rich because it depends on who you're talking to. So how do you define rich? The, the problem with trying to define rich is that rich is really a moving target. That depending on who you're talking to, 
it's going to determine what they think rich is. You know, I hear people talk all the time about the rich as if they are not part of it. They think the rich people are the people who stand in circles and they have those little eyeglasses that go over one eye and laugh. <laughs> and they sit around and talk about a caviar and gray poupon. That's what I was rich for me is you had gray poupon. We had Miracle Whip. I don't even know what gray poupon was used for. But here's the, the reality is that we saw is that when, if you make 37,000, most people, if you said make 37,000, you're rich, you'll say that, that, not, that pays for babysitting. I'm going to do it 37,000, especially in this area that we live in. But in the world, you're in the top 4%. And so here's the problem, that we don't even recognize that we're rich. We have this mentality that, oh, I, I don't have enough. And so we look at the rich as if they are those people. In fact, rich people are sort of they're stuck up, they're snobby, we don't really like them because of all the money that they make. In fact, one senator, she wore a dress to the Met Gala in the back that said, tax the rich. I thought, that's interesting, because you're one of them. <laughs> this senator makes $174,000 a year, and it costs 35000 to get a ticket into the Met Gala. Now, I know what we mean when we say, the rich, we're talking about those who make an insane amount of money. I think the number is somewhere like 400000 a year is that high tax bracket. But here's, here's the point. You are rich. And we think we're not rich. But the truth is, the reality is that we are rich. And Andy Stanley says the biggest challenge facing rich people is that they've lost the ability to recognize that they're rich. They lost the ability to recognize that they're rich. So all the talk today is about COVID-19. And COVID-19 is a real problem, but I think there's another problem that is ravaging the world. And the title of the message this morning is affluenza. Affluenza. It's a combination of two words, influenza, influenza, which is a viral infection that attacks your respiratory system. And then the second word, affluence, which is the state of having lots of money. So when you put those two terms together, you get the word affluenza. And how would you define affluenza? Let me give you a definition. It is extreme materialism and consumerism associated with the pursuit of wealth and success and resulting in a life of chronic dissatisfaction, debt, overwork, stress, and impaired relationships. Affluenza. In our text today, the teacher is going to teach us that pursuing money and wealth is meaningless. So if you're there, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Last week, we went with the teacher into the house of God, and he talked to us about reverencing God and being in awe of who he is. And as soon as we step out of the doors of the church, we are faced with something that we see all the time. That is oppression. Look at verse 8. If you see the poor oppressed in a district, and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. One of the most, I think, crazy things is the people who are supposed to be protecting us and to be righteous and are supposed to be looking out for us are the very people who are corrupt themselves. And in government, it's systemic. They're, they look out for each other. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And what's crazy is that the people that we look to for justice are actually the ones that are, that are unjust. In fact, you remember that scene from Batman Begins when a young Bruce Wayne, he goes to confront Falcone and he goes into this little crime lord lair 
And when he goes in there, he sits down with Falcone, and Falcone says, I want you to look around. He says, there's two council members over there, a couple of off-duty cops, and there goes a, a judge. What are you supposed to do when the city council, the police officers, and the judges are all in cahoots together to oppress the people? What are you supposed to do? And what is it the thing that causes them to act that way? Love of money, greed, affluenza. So what are we going to see today? One, we're going to look at the complications of affluenza, and then we'll see the cure for affluenza. The complications of affluenza, and then the cure for affluenza. Now, before we get into this, I want to make this point because I want you to understand this. Money is not evil. Money inherently itself is not evil. What the Bible says, in fact, that it is the love of money. That is the root of all kinds of evils. In fact, keep your finger here and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you're a quick turner, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I want you to keep your your finger here because I'm going to come back to it a few times during the message. But... 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy. He says to him, now watch, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You hear all the problems that are associated with the love of money. Fall into temptation and a trap. Many foolish and harmful desires plunge them into ruin and destruction. All this from wanting, desiring, loving money. Notice, though, he did not say that having money or being rich, he said it's the desire. It's being eager for it. God has made some people rich. When you read the Bible, even the author of this book, Ecclesiastes, was very rich. There's nothing wrong with being rich and having money. But if the money has you, if you worship the money, if you desire that money above even God, then that's where it becomes a problem. So this is one of the most misquoted scriptures in all of the Bible. People say money is the root of all evil. So you can't have money. Get rid of all, get rid of all that. You need to live terribly. No. Just don't love it. Don't worship it. Jesus said you cannot worship God and money. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. And so as we go into this, um, I, I want you to see that um, the, the issue here is not loving money. I would say the issue here is not <coughs> having money, it's loving it. So what are the complications of affluenza as we see? Here's the first one. That money doesn't satisfy. Money doesn't satisfy. Verse 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. So he says the person who loves money, they never have enough. And the person who loves wealth They never have enough. Some of you remember John D. Rockefeller. He was extremely wealthy. At one point, his his net worth was uh, 1% of the U.S. economy. And he owned 90% of all the gas and oil companies. He was insanely rich. He made Bill Gates look like a beggar. And they asked him, how much money is enough? How much money do you need? He said, just a little bit more. In fact, they asked a bunch of millionaires, some of them uh, making about $25 million a year, how much would it take for you to feel secure? <clears throat> and they said, a little bit more. $25 million? And you don't feel secure? Here's the problem. If you have money, you never have money enough. The, the creators of the slot machine understand this. 
Because when you win, I remember we went to Reno and everybody was winning the penny slots. I never played penny slots, so I was like, let me try these penny slots. Everybody's winning. Maybe there's a blessing in it for me. So I sat down. I started to play. And I don't understand how there's all these pay, you know, things. And I'm like, I don't understand how this thing works. So I put my money in there. Start off with $10. Put that $10 in. <clears throat> start to go down, start to go down. And all of a sudden, all the lights going off. And I'm thinking, oh, I mean, it's going crazy. The lights are going off. And I'm thinking, I, now I don't understand, like, what I'm winning. I'm just waiting for the end. <clears throat> and so it's going on and on and on and on. And I'm starting to get more and more because it keeps going. I'm just going, Woo-hoo. and I get more excited. So I think I got my down payment to my house. Man, that thing stopped. $40. I said, oh. So you know what I did? I said, you know what? I could do it. I can win. I could get us a little bit more. I came in back into the room. You know how much I had? Five cents. <laughs> All that money that I had won, gone. Why? Because they understand that when you win, you have the desire to win even more. You're not satisfied. My wife, if she wins, she cash out. <laughs> She's always behind my shoulder. Cash out, cash out, cash out, cash out. Because <laughs> she knows, like, I'm going to keep playing. Because if you have, if you have Money, you're never satisfied. You always want more. And this is what he said. He said, if, if you have it, you'll just want more of it. Here's, another, here's the second one. Complication, that it attracts moochers. Verse 11. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? As soon as you... Win some money. As soon as you get into a little bit of money, here come everybody. Somebody go, hey, man, how you doing? What has it been? With 23 years? What was it? The last time I saw you was what? Third grade? Yeah, we, I mean, we used to, you know, be on the monkey bars. I remember that. Look here, man. I'm homeless. <laughs> People who never like your Facebook posts, all of a sudden, they're liking everything you say. What's he saying? He's saying as soon as you get money, all of a sudden, people start coming out of everywhere. Hey, man, I heard. Friends, family, the government. <laughs> now you have maids. You have somebody that has to cut your grass. You have all these things. And before you know it, what he's saying is you as a rich person, all you're doing is watching everybody else consume your money. It's a magnet for moochers and for people who all they want to do is take what you have. Here's the third complication. It, you lose sleep. Verse 12, the sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. So there's two ideas here. First is, in that day, if you had a lot of money, you were able to eat a lot. So if you ate so much that you, when you laid down, you had indigestion, and you can't go to sleep. But here's the other thing that happens when you have a lot of money. You, you are up at night worrying about it. Oh, is this investment going to go through? Is that door locked? You ever, you ever leave the house and can't remember if you left the stove on? You know how many times I've left my house, like, did I close the garage? And it ruins your whole day because you're like, man, do I need to drive back home? But if I drive all the way back home and it's closed, I'm going to be mad. And so you just can't concentrate. Imagine up at night, you just sit, man, did that investment go through? Is that person going to come through? Is that deal really a deal? And you lose sleep. He says the, the, the regular day worker who just goes to work and digs ditches, comes home, has some oatmeal, goes to bed, he has a good sleep. Everybody else who has all this money can't sleep, insomnia. Here's the fourth complication. You can lose it. Verse 13. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. Or wealth lost through some misfortune. So that when they have children, there's nothing left for them to inherit. So here's the thing about money. You can lose it. You can lose it in a fire. You can lose it the stock market crash. 
Like, what you have is not permanent. I was reading about a guy in 2008 who lost everything, lost it all. And it took him seven, he, for seven years, he didn't have a car. And for seven years, he tried to build himself back to where he was before. And once he got back to that place, he was so afraid of it happening, happening again. Just over and over and over and over, whatever he was doing, he was nervous. He was checking the stocks, checking everything because he was afraid. You could lose it at any moment. Here's the next one. You can't take it with you. Verse 15. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? You came into this world naked. You didn't bring with you anything. And when you leave this world, you're going to leave with nothing. You can't take what you have built for yourself here with you. Imagine if I were to say to you, hey, today I'm going to take you to any store you want and you can do a shopping spree. You can get whatever you want, put whatever you want into the basket. And so you go to Safeway, you can go to Target, you can go to Walmart, you can go to Costco. So we go out, you go to one of these stores, you start filling that basket up, all kinds of stuff, food, clothes, everything. Then we get to the checkout and I say, all right, you can't take it out the store. <laughs> you say, well, then what was the point? If I can't take it out of the store, what's the point of stocking it all up? Which is really the point he's making. Why? Stock up all this stuff in this world that you can't take with you. We, we've said it a, a lot. You don't see a U-Haul behind a hearst. There's a reason for that. All the stuff that's in that U-Haul is being fought over by the family now. Because you can't use it. You can't take it with you. Here's the next one. It leads to an isolated frustrating and stressful life. Verse 17. All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. The life of someone who is pursuing wealth above and over everything leads to an isolated life. They, they eat in darkness. They are frustrated. They are angry. No wonder. Look at all the problems that they have that come with money. It, I, I read of a guy who sent an email to a financial advisor, and he said to her, he said, I make $20,000 a month, and I'm not happy. I thought, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. $20,000 a month? And you're not happy? They always say money can't buy happiness. And I'm always like, let me try. <laughs> Let me try. But it's true. If you know rich people, and I know a few rich people, all the money that they have doesn't make them happy. It leads to a frustrating and isolated life. It's a stressful life. Here's a seventh complication. Is satisfaction is sold separately. Skip down to verse 1 of chapter 6. He says, I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. So satisfaction is sold separately. Just because you have it doesn't mean you'll even get to enjoy it. You ever bought something? And it has that annoying thing in it that says batteries sold separately. Yeah. You're like, why? I have the thing that I'm supposed to enjoy, but I can't enjoy it because really what is going to give it satisfaction is sold separately. And that's what the teacher is saying. You can have all the things that you think are going to make you happy, but satisfaction is actually sold separately. Because satisfaction, he's going to show us, is really found in knowing God. 
And if you don't know God, you can't find real satisfaction in all the stuff that you have. Now he goes on and he's going to say just how hopeless the situation is. And he gives this sort of uh, example, probably fictitious. He says, a man may have a hundred children and live many years. So in the Jewish mind, someone who was really, really wealthy was someone who had a lot of wealth, they had a lot of children, and they lived a long life. So he says, this is a person who has it all, according to the Jewish mind. Hundred children, live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial. So he, li- he has all this stuff and he can't even enjoy it. It doesn't tell us why he can't enjoy it. He just can't. Maybe he got sick. Maybe he died. Maybe he got lost. We don't know. But a stranger is now enjoying all that he worked for and he doesn't even receive a proper burial. He dies and nobody cares. People are at his funeral only to find out what they get. You ever go to somebody's funeral and people lying? He was such a great man. Like, he was a devil. Or people who are there, you know, the only reason that they're there is because they know I might be in the will. Doesn't even, he doesn't even receive a proper burial. And then he gives this very dark comparison of someone who has everything but can't enjoy it, he compares it to a stillborn child. Look at verse 4. And does not receive proper burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place. Why use such a dark comparison? Something that is as tragic and heartbreaking as losing a child because what he's trying to show us is that if you live your life and you get everything only not to enjoy it and die with nothing it's better than if you had never lived you go from being in the womb to being with your creator having never gone through all the things that that man has to go through in fact what he's saying is if This child, never seeing the light of day, this baby is actually in the arms of its creator and did not have to endure all the problems under the sun. A person can have everything that life has to offer and still be miserable. But if we're so unhappy with life, then maybe we would be better off never have lived at all. And he talks about this child that has been, they pass away in the room. That's when he says it's in darkness and its name is shrouded. The name is connected with personality and character, saying this child, you never got to see its personality, never got to see its character. In fact, some families in, in, in Jewish culture, when they had a stillborn, they wouldn't name the child so that they wouldn't have to remember he says, isn't it, it was tragic to live your whole life chasing after so many things and then die without God. Then to have a stillborn who never comes into the world but dies a bit is with God forever. So he's trying to let us see, listen, to have everything. I mean, it reminds me of what Jesus said about Judas. It'd been better if he had never been born. That sometimes it's, it's living this life and living it without God. It, it's not better. Some people say, well, it's better to have loved and lost to have never loved at all. Some people say no. Satisfaction is sold separately. If you have everything and you're not able to enjoy it, what's the point? And then he continues and says, listen, 
You can try and find satisfaction in so many things. In eating, verse 7, everyone's toil is for their mouth, yet their appetite is never satisfied. You eat food and you're hungry 45 minutes later. (laughs) Wisdom doesn't satisfy. Verse 8, what advantage have the wise over fools? What do the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? There's no satisfaction in poverty. So what about dreaming? Look at verse 9. Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. What he's saying is it's better for you to just enjoy what you have rather than try to dream about what you don't have. Then he says, it is what it is. Verse 10. Whatever exists has already been named. And what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. Who is stronger in this sense? It is God. The more words, the less meaning. And how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they're gone? He said, there's, you don't find satisfaction in wisdom, in dreaming, in poverty, in riches. And at the end, it is what it is. You can't do nothing about it. God has set things the way they are. It, it looks back to Genesis where Adam names the animals and God sets things how they are. There's nothing you can do to change the way the world is under the sun. And we might ask questions, God, you got to give me an answer. You got to bend your reality to my reality, which is silly. That's like trying to knock over this building with a tennis ball. Won't happen. And so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to humble ourselves before the sovereign of heaven, because it is what it is. I read of a Navy communication. Voice one said, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. Voice two, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Voice one, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Voice two. No, I say again, divert your course. (laughs) Voice one. This is the aircraft carrier enterprise. We are a large warship of the U.S. Navy. Divert your course now. Voice two. This is a lighthouse. Your call. (laughs) (laughs) And then the commentator says... (laughs) the commentator says reality is a solid rock with a lighthouse sitting upon it and we can either alter our course to take account of it or keep on going until it imposes itself on us with force It is what it is. What the way life is, is the way life is going to be. You can ask questions, you can fight, you can fuss, but at the end of the day, it's going to be what it's going to be. You need to divert your course. So what are we supposed to do? What's the cure then for affluenza? Look back up at chapter 5 and verse 18. He gives us the cure for it. The cure for affluenza is contentment. Verse 18, so this is what I have observed to be good. That is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. What is the cure for affluenza? It is contentment. How much is enough? How much is enough? I think enough is not an amount, it's an attitude. Contentment. Did you notice that the teacher is trying to help us see that everything that we have is a gift from God. You notice how often he mentions God and him giving? 
He says, God has given them. God gives someone wealth. This is the gift of God. God keeps them. So all that we see in this text shows us that all that we have, the life that we have, it comes to us as a gift from God, and we are to enjoy what he's given us. It's Eleanor Roosevelt who said, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Have you taken advantage of the gifts that God has given to you to enjoy? Now, if this sounds familiar to you, it's because this is the third time, third or fourth time, that we've come to what is called in the book of Ecclesiastes the enjoyment passages, where the 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 author says, yeah, life is crazy under the sun, but this is what you can do. You can enjoy what you have. And I'm going to continue to say this week after week until it becomes a part of who we are. Enjoy food and enjoy drink to the glory of God. It is his gift to you. This week I took my family to Pier 39. And so many great things to do at the pier. And we were walking around, there was shops, went into the shops, bought a bunch of things. There was a mirror maze, which is, I've been in a few mirror mazes in my life. This is the first time my kids were able to experience a mirror maze, which is hilarious. (laughs) Here's the thing I think about enjoying life is making memories with your kids. If you've been in a mirror maze, you know, like, is mirror and there's a way to get through and it's 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 really trippy because you can see sometimes all the way down you see a reflection and you're trying to make your way through and so Connie she was going through and she thought she was just so smart she was going through with confidence and she left us and she was she couldn't see her couldn't find her and then we heard her going mommy <laughs> daddy so where are you honey I, I'm lost <laughs> <laughs> and her mommy said I'm not going to let you be lost, baby. I'm going to come find you. And she took, now the thing is, in a mirror maze, you can't just, you can't just go off with full, full speed. All right, you're going to break your face and your teeth. So she's walking through the mirror, to look, trying to make sure she doesn't run into a mirror. And she finally finds Connie, picks her up. Oh, you found me. Those are just things you do not forget. You don't forget experiences like that. You don't forget sitting down and eating food with your kids. We had, there's Dryer's ice cream and Mrs. Fields and uh, mini donuts and there was just food and you just sit down and you enjoy. That's why I always say, after, lu- after church we go on a lunch. And you sit down, but here's something I want you to, to understand and recognize. We have food, we have drink, we have all these things, but, but something I want you to recognize is that God doesn't just give you things to enjoy. He gives you the ability to enjoy them. So there was a wealthy man. He had all the money in the world, would take friends out for dinner, but the problem was he couldn't taste. So he's at dinner. They all eating. He's eating, but he can't taste it. Money can't buy taste. You can't go to the store. Let me get a uh, pack of them taste buds. You can't do it. It's a gift. So God doesn't just give us a can of fruit cocktail. He gives us a can opener. He gives us the ability to enjoy all that we have. So uh, the enjoyment passages are there to help us see that, yeah, life in this world, life under the sun is difficult. It is. But you see what he said at the end there? They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Why do they have gladness of heart? Well, because they have the gifts that God has given, but also because they have the giver of the gifts. And that's where they find their contentment. Now, um, I want to give you two strategies to help you cultivate contentment. Two strategies to help you cultivate contentment. And I want to use the word cultivate because as rich people, um, contentment is something that we struggle with. And so I want us to to work on it. We are rich people, and so we're going to have to work on being more content. Here's the word that I want you to focus on. 
and think through, it is the word awareness. Awareness, awareness. Awareness feeds discontentment. What I mean by awareness is seeing is needing. You ever gone to TJ Maxx or Home Goods or Marshalls, and when you get to the place where you get ready to check out, you got to go through that maze of products? <laughs> and you went there for some of you are like I don't know, but if you've been there, it has it's just a line and it has a whole bunch of stuff. And in order to get to the checkout, you got to go through all that stuff, and you're standing there in line. You just went there for a shirt and a pillow. <laughs> and then when you just st- as you're standing there, you think, hmm, you know, I need gourmet popcorn. I do. I need a scarf flashlight. (laughs) Just because you see it, you need it. If you know me, like the 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 uh, my kryptonite is the as seen on TV section. I'm always my wife's like, don't you go over there? I'll be right back. (laughs) And you're there, and you you see all these products, and when you see it, he's like, I need that. I'm like, man, I've been boiling water like a simpleton. Just putting it in water. With this contraption, you just put the egg in here, push the button, and now you have boiled eggs. I need this. The oven glove? You just put your hand in and you can take stuff out of the oven, but it's like a glove? And my wife's just sitting there like, no. No. I have to sneak stuff in the house. Because I always come in the house and go, what do you got? Nothing. Because when I see it, you think you need it. But the reality is you don't need it. It's because you see it, you think that you do. And so this is what advertisers understand. They understand if they can put these things in front of you all the time, it feeds your discontentment. It used to be a time we didn't replace stuff until it broke. Now we upgrade because a new one came out. And they put Coca-Cola and Pepsi, they're wonderful at this, right? Putting their product everywhere so that when we're thirsty, we say, oh, I want a Coke, I want a Pepsi. Who says, I would like, can you get me an RC Cola? (laughs) No one wants an RC Cola because what you see all the time is Coke, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Sprite. Because they do a great job of when you see it, you think you need it, and it feeds that discontentment. And here's the thing about contentment. Contentment actually makes you richer. Because if you, instead of, you never have buyer's remorse, you buy something, you're like, oh, why did I buy that? And you, I wish I had the hindsight, I wish I had the wisdom to not buy this and to instead be content with what I have. And if you didn't buy it, you actually would have more money. Imagine if you didn't spend on things that you really didn't need. How much more money would you have? Now, awareness, so here's, here's the, the application. If awareness feeds discontentment, what you need to do is make sure you're not putting yourself in places where you will feed your discontentment. Stop walking through the mall. Stop going into, into the store to browse. Can I help you, ma'am? No, just browsing. And then you end up buying. It's important for believers that we are constantly thinking about awareness because God has given us things to enjoy, but he wants us to be responsible with what we have. And so here's the other way you can use awareness. And Andy Stanley tells a story of he got invited to uh, a prayer Um, service after the inauguration of one of the presidents and they said we want you to come and want you to uh, wear your best um, suit whatever you have that represents your own faiths um, your own faith and he said okay well they're, they're very casual people they didn't have suits and all that stuff and his wife didn't have a dress and so he said to her well we gotta go find something so he goes out gets a shirt gets a a blazer looks nice she goes out and she calls him, and he can hear her kind of, she's kind of quiet. He says, um, you all right? He says, yeah, I, I found something. It's great. But the way she was talking, he's like, mm, where are you? And she was at one of the most expensive department stores in Atlanta. And there was a dress there that cost $3,000. That's, that's just for the dress. That's not shoes and other accessories. 
And so when she, when she said that, he said, hmm, he started to think, okay, I want to do this for her because I want her to look great. You know, you're going to meet the president and senators and Supreme Court justices. I want everything to look the way it's supposed to look. But what am I going to do with a $3,000 dress? He thought, well, she can wear it and then put it on eBay. He said, oh, she wore it once to go see this president. And so as he's thinking about what to do, she starts laughing. She says, you know, I could never spend $3,000 on a dress. And then she said something that floored him. She said, when I looked at the price tag, all I could see were the precious faces of those orphans at New Hope Homes in Kilgali in Rwanda. And I thought, imagine what $3,000 would do for them. Yeah. Earlier, they had gone on a mission trip to Rwanda to see this area where they were building homes. And there was a family there that were putting families, uh, kids, into homes that had no family. They had lost their mom and their dad. And what they, what they found out is that they could build almost a two-bedroom addition to these homes for about $3,000. And so her awareness was, man, if I think about this dress that I wear once versus $3,000 that will help put two kids into their own room for who knows how long, how can I spend $3,000 on, on this thing that I'll only use once? And here's the interesting point that I think Paul wants us to get, what the writer of Ecclesiastes wants us to get, that you miss money that you misspend, you miss money that you waste poorly or invest poorly, but you never miss money that is given to a need in someone's life. Amen. You've never, you have never said, oh man, I wish I had that money that I gave to the orphans. <laughs> never done that. Amen. So what is God calling us to do? If your finger's still in 1 Timothy, open and look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, Command those who are rich in this present world. Who is he talking to? See, we would read that and say, Oh, I know who he, he's talking to, the rich. No, he's talking to you. Look what he says. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Sounds like Paul's been reading Ecclesiastes. <laughs> That's exactly what Kohelet has been saying. And then watch what he says. Command them <coughs> to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So what is the call this morning? Enjoy what you have. God has given it to you for your enjoyment, but be content in it. I want, you to, I want you to think about this because this is very important for you to understand that you need to learn how to starve your appetites. Because when you just continue to say, oh, I have the money, therefore I get it. it it's funny how people, before the stimulus check, <laughs> there were things they would never think about. Isn't it funny? You got the stimulus check, you're like, you know what I need? <laughs> you know what I've always... Just a little extra money in your pocket. But God, he's calling us to be responsible, to look outside of ourselves. And again, remember, he gives people money. He gives people riches. God is not against riches. He makes people rich. But what are you going to do with the money that you have? Let me end by giving you the words of Jesus. He said to them, this is Luke 12, verse 15. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life, listen, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. That is not truly life. Later on, Jesus would say, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world, lose his soul? Bow your heads with me. Thank you for listening. 
If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.